we are running in a very clumsy way. What we have here, I suppose I better look at the long-winded way. Right. We have, yeah, we have Lee's ES339, very nice condition. And um, it's a, a very short little strap. <laughs> so I shall be sort of trying to put it on. Um, just gonna hold it there for a minute, get myself a cable. and play it through the old <coughs> katana. Now, I've been very bad recently and not played, demoed any guitars. And, um, and I've actually not stuck with this katana long enough to get a sort of working sound that I like out of it. So, I ought to, really, bear with me. Oof. Oof. Hear that pinging? loose that pinging sound was the string getting caught in the uh, whatever that thing is nut and it makes it very difficult to um, it will stop it from moving through the nut properly um, and it will cause it to go out of tune so I don't know why this always comes on with the booster full on when I don't really want it. I just want a clean sound. Reverb off, gain, downish, volume upish. Everything sort of averagey ish. to be. It's got a lovely sound. That's a lot of 
boost for the uh, orange second. <laughs> just leave that off to one side for a minute because I've got to clean under there and we'll take off the strap. So this is Lee's ES339 with a lovely Levy's, Levy's strap. Uh, the suede one, I've got one like that, an older one, but it's still the same suede and it's gorgeous. Um, it's the best feeling strap I've ever had. Um, it's a good choice there. So this is Lee's ES339 and it's kind of uh, familiar. We've seen a lot of these recently. Um, it's the inspired by, oh yeah, now look, I'm calling it inspired by Gibson. It's not, is it? Oh, don't tell me, please don't tell me. Oh my God, have I gone and, uh, if this, hold on, sorry about this. If uh, I've assumed this is the inspired by Gibson one with the, well, it doesn't look, it's, oh, I can't remember now. Let's have a look in here. Is this the inspired? No, it's the dot ES339. Why didn't you tell me? Okay, well, that's actually the same color. So that's very cool. I'm glad about that. Uh, all right, so I've seen recently a lot of um, ES339s, which are the inspired by um, Gibson ones. And this is, uh, I've got a big fly in here, so forgive me on that. This is um, dot version. And the reason I sort of suddenly kind of caught me because I haven't seen a plastic nut on here for a while. And this has definitely got a plastic nut, which was causing the pinging. Um, otherwise, we've got the good stuff that you find um, on the Epiphone guitars. Um, dot ES339, EB, Ebony, Black, maybe, I don't know. Um, but a nice all round guitar this fly is sorry gonna drive me mad no I'm gonna be stuck with it I don't want to hurt a fly so I'm gonna to have to live with it anyway so this is in for a setup and um, it's gonna get the full setup which is going to include fitting the no that fly really is bugging me um, it's gonna include fitting the uh, um, roller bridge which takes the sharp edge off here off the hands and it gives a little bit more intonation room I think it's a not a bad little improvement on the whole thing for about 20 quid so it's not a hugely expensive thing what oh that's undone let me need to tie, tighten that up um, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to give it a precision level and I'm going to replace this with a custom tusk adjustable nut which I'll make from one of my 3d printed bases here plus the graph tech um, permanently lubricated nut which makes this stay in tune which is a great improvement will also refit with nine gauge strings on here so what I'm hoping that Lee will get out of this is a lower action at both ends so we will be able to drop the action down we'll measure it up now and have a look but we'll drop the action down at both ends so it will feel even lighter to play which is what we're aiming for so let's just put this down here um, and I've got me a my little mirror to try and see what I'm looking at as I go. Not very easy. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just do a little quick measurement of things. Now, 
No, I didn't get it. Um, I don't really want to kill it. So I've got an action at the last fret as I would measure it. Now, there are different schools of thought, and it doesn't really matter where you measure it as long as it works for you. I prefer to it at the last fret, and it's about just over two millimeters, and on the high, on the uh, toppy, it's 1.5. So we've got a little bit of downwards we can go. Not a huge amount. The action's pretty good. Um, so we've got, I think it's about 2.2 .2 on low E, 1.5 on the high E, and we'll take that down a little bit. What I don't know, um, particularly, is uh, how well it plays all the way up and down at the moment. And what we often find is there are either um, you can find individual frets that can choke, and that's because a single fret's too high. Uh, and, um, and then we find little buzzy ones like this, which are a little bit zingy. And if we lower them even more, they'll be a bit zingier too. Now, um, So we've got a little bit of um, fret slap here. Now I call that fret slap to dis dif differentiate it between. Um, I missed, missed my fuzz in my razor. How oh, silly! <laughs> um, I differentiate between uh, fret buzz, which is usually caused by a single high or low fret, and you usually find it in a single place somewhere on the neck, and what I call fret slap, which is um, tends to be a bit of buzz that runs a lot across a whole section of the neck and it's usually caused by the overall undulation as opposed to single high fret. So we've got peaks and troughs. So they're, they're kind of cured in the same way or adjusted or dealt with in the same way but they require sort of I think about them differently even though they're all part of the same thing but you'll hear me sort of probably hear me talking about fret slap versus fret buzz. So I didn't hear any major fret buzz but I did hear some fret slap, which is very common, and I would expect to hear it a little bit more, or hear some more, when I lower the action to where I want it to be. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the truss rod cover. Um, now one of the things I must stress, and this is a message directly to Lee, um, you must get comfortable doing this. Now I know it's great, I mean, in Lee's case, her dad has brought the guitar over to me and I'm grateful for that but while I'm going to do the truss rod adjustment at this point in time um, to do the setup um, it I really recommend everybody who owns a guitar gets used to doing their own truss rod adjustment now I've just managed to drop the, the uh, screw in there yeah so the reason you need to learn to adjust the truss rod yourself is the truss rod is what controls the bend in your guitar's neck and the first thing you have to recognize is and I'll draw a little picture the guitar's neck never stays the same all the time which is a bit of a, a bummer because you think well I've paid a guitar guy to do it a guitar person um, and now I now I'm going he's telling me I'm going to have to make an adjustment so the thing about your neck let's see where am I drawing from here to somewhere here so your guitar neck, first of all, um, can't be that shape, right? That's the first piece of rule of thumb. If your guitar neck is that shape, and quite often they can be, um, and these are the frets, it's called back bowed. It means it's got a hump, a convex hump. If your guitar neck happens to have that shape or it goes into that shape, you won't be able to play thing, uh, notes because the nut's there and the strings will kind of hit the middle uh, as they go across to the bridge and pretty much all the notes played here will buzz because or choke out completely because of that hump in the middle so rule number one is you cannot have back bow so people say to me how much how much relief do i or how much curvature do i need in my neck well the first one is you can't have back bow whatever happens so that's one thing then the next question comes out is well can i have my neck dead straight and there's your dead straight neck. And the answer there is yes, you can have a dead straight neck and the guitar will play because at each end you've got a nut here, let's say a bridge here, it's not quite right, is it? But you know what I mean. And the nut will lift the 
string over the frets and they'll keep going up a little bit all the way down to the bridge okay and so you can see there that nothing is immediately in the way all the time and when you bend the string down to a fret doink, and it comes off there you can see that it will come away on a sort of slight uphill until it reaches the bridge and it clears the other frets after it so flat is okay now I say okay because some people like flat um, it feels nice it, it makes the action feel low right um, with all, all other things considered a flat neck can make the action feel low but a flat neck requires a couple of things first of all it requires one level frets okay if you've got uneven frets hiding in here and you've got a, a flat neck the um, strings will hit them as they're spinning much quicker so it requires level frets and the other thing is it requires room for the strings to move so that's that's a kind of so I can have a flat profile in my neck um, and I have to have room for strings to move well uh, to, to have room I have to have a certain height above the strings. so it means to create this room for the strings to move so they don't rattle and slap into these frets I have to set my action at both ends a little bit higher possibly than if I had some curvature in the neck and I'll draw a picture of what it looks like when the neck is curved but the rule is you can have it slightly uh, you can have it flat but you need to possibly raise the action a little bit now if we have a little bit of relief so imagine going from dead flat to the tiniest bit of a curvature I've exaggerated it right from flat to a tiny bit of curvature what we've got is the frets sitting on this very slight curve all the way down the neck right and the strings basically go start there and they go off there all the way down to the bridge somewhere way down there so you can see that it starts off with a certain minimum height here and the height only gets bigger until it reaches the sort of middle of the neck whereupon it gets smaller again as you come to at the end here so having a curve in the neck you create a little bit of space for your strings to do what strings do so if you remember the old skipping rope idea when you and somebody spin a skipping rope it spins a lot in the middle and not much at the end so if you imagine a skipping rope or a rope being spun in there you can see that the curvature of that neck gives the strings a little bit of room so this is called as opposed to flat sorry uh, back bowed and flat this is called relieved meaning there is a concave curve convex is like that concave is concave convex right so it's a concavity a relieved neck which is curved downwards now curved neck if you have too much curve you can make this space in the middle where we saw that red gap there between the string and the fretboard it can feel quite large and it can make the action feel high even if you've got a quite a low action set either end so it's a balance between those things the profile of the neck whether it's flat back bowed you can't have or relieved and how high you have your actions at either end of course another variable in the middle of all of that is how hard you hit the strings all right so if you hit the strings really hard and cause them to spin a lot uh, you are going to need a higher action generally and or more curvature to allow the strings to move if you're a very light player um, then you can get away with a much lower action at either end and a flatter neck so I hope you get the sort of idea about the the the, the shape of the neck and how it relates to the way the strings move that's the that's an important thing to know now the issue about the adjustment of the neck is a neck is it might be flat let's say a neck starts out flat on the guitar when it's sitting here with no strings on when we put the strings on the strings load the neck and try usually uh, if they're strong enough usually do they, they put a curve onto the neck and that's the force of the strings pulling the two ends together so they, the strings pull from the machine head end or the tuner's end down to the bridge end and those those are kind of pulling that way 
And what it does is it forces this wood to bend. All right? So that's a standard sort of situation when you put, uh, put some strings on a wooden neck. And the point about this is that all necks are different, all strings are different, and one day's temperature, it'll look like that, and on another day, humidity and temperature, the same loading strings on the same neck may may the neck may flatten out and have a slightly different shape. So first rule is it's constantly changing due to even if you have the string gauge, string gauge, uh, the type of neck, um, it's constantly changing thanks to temperature, humidity, and mainly the two factors. Uh, so, so you can see straight away, even if you keep the same things, things all the same on your guitar, uh, you could fly to some holiday destination, get it out of the bag, and you've got, suddenly you've got rattles and buzzes that you didn't have when you played it at home. And that would be because while in your home environment, the neck, the, the sort of pliable neck was happily curved just enough to work with the height that you had the string set up. Then you go away to, let's say, a, I don't know, a drier place in a holiday, and you get it out of the bag and it's dried out a little bit, the neck, the moisture's gone and it's flattened out, for example. And suddenly these strings now are pulled lower because it's flattened out, there's, there's no, by no means as much gap and they're suddenly hitting the frets and it sounds terrible. So that's a fact all year round, that changes all year round. In some guitars it will change much more, in some environments it will change much more and, and you know, it, it it can be hard to figure out which of the things would, are, the, are the factors that change it. So it could be central heating, it could be uh, relative humidity in the air and so on. But because this does change, uh, it, it very possibly means that the setup that we might put on this guitar now may very well change by the time we get round to next autumn, for example. And what, what we set up as a beautiful low playing guitar may suddenly buzz and annoy the hell out of you in six months time because the amount of change that's required to make that happen is m absolutely tiny but that's the beauty of um, setting guitars up and making them play low and light so I'll set it up today for the environment we're in here which would probably be very similar to the condition it was when your dad brought it um, and since we're in the same part of the world it's probably a very similar condition or a similar environment but I want you to be conscious of the fact that you will probably need to adjust it and I'll show you how. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to check here's how you check if the shape of the neck has changed or if there is any curvature in your neck and it's quite simple. I'm going to do it by hand. You can use a capo if you've got one. Um, let's just look down here and see if I can see everything. Yes I think so. So to check the shape of the neck we could get a ruler on it but we've got the strings and they can work as a straight line so I hold down the first first and the string, the bass string, bass E, hold it on the first and the last frets simultaneously. And what that does is it then stretches the string in a line between uh, those two points. And somewhere in the middle, it doesn't have to be exact, but about the eighth fret, ninth fret, you can press down and you can see a gap. If there is a, if there's no gap at all, it means your neck is either fl dead flat or back bowed. If there's a little gap of any size gap and I mean tiny so that you can press down and just hear it click then your neck is slightly relieved and the question then people say is well how much relief do I, I need and my view on this would be to say just enough to be able to detect a gap and press it down and hear it click now you could say to me again well what's that in real terms and I could get my my um, measuring thingies out these some people love to swear by that and I could say well I might be looking for about at most 0.2 of a millimeter and the problem is I haven't got a I didn't bring a, a capo with me so I'm not going to be able to do it but let's say you had the capo down on the first fret and holding this one down what you can do is you can put your feeler gauges in between around about the uh, where are we about the eighth fret and you can you can check the gap and you know, it may find out that 0.2 is um, just about right. I work at about 0.15. It's very hard to do. So rather than worry about little numbers, because nobody, the guitar doesn't care about the numbers. All the guitar cares about is that you have a tiny bit more than no relief. So 
tiny bit curved and I would say is you you do it you adjust it until it's got a tiny little bit of space and if it doesn't have any you slack it and then you allow it to create uh, to you reduce the tension of the truss rod and it it slackens and allows the strings to pull more curvature into the neck and you find then you've got that tiny little gap that you needed now on this one this feels about half a millimeter so it's too much relief curve so i'm going to dial some of that out before we even start but what i want to do is just check what the gauge of these strings is are and i think they're probably nines um i oh know actually they're tens right so the they're going the strings we're going to put on are going to be lighter than this so they won't pull as hard so i'll, I'll we, we could wait and do the adjustment should we do the adjustment afterwards Um, I, I don't want to waste a sacrificial set of nines. I can do the leveling with the tens on. Um, let's do it after. Let's do it after I've done the leveling and then we'll come back to it. So remember that. We'll come back to things to remember. We'll come back to uh, set the truss rod for nines. We'll double check it and make sure it's right. And second one is uh, three way switch. Tighten. Okay, so there's a couple of things I need to remind myself. So the first thing I'm going to do, and let's get a, a sort of zoom in from over here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set three things. So remember there, there's there's the issue of, um, oh, let's put it this way. I, I describe the playing action as a com uh, three constituent parts. There's the first thing we, we, we can set is the neck relief. Um, now I'm going to do it since we're working with tens and we can reset it. Let me do it just so we get this bit cleanly done. So I'm going to get the uh, hex key that comes with this for most guitars. Uh, what's the best one to use? Got a few of these things. We want a four millimeter one, please. Should be anyway. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do is, if you remember, I said there's too much gap, right? So to adjust it, what I do is I put the four millimeter hex key in and wiggle it until it sort of sits into place. Now, I've got two types. I've got this type and I've got a sort of rubber handle one. I'm just going to use that one first because I can get a feel about what's going on here. Okay, this is right slack in the middle position at the moment. Okay, so that was, what we're going to do is we're going to tighten this up. So having just discovered that the, the adjuster is currently in a sort of slack position, if you've got too much curvature in the neck and you want to flatten the neck out, what you do is you put the adjuster in the end here and looking down at the end, you're going to... Um, there's not a lot of access room in here. You're going to put the adjuster in and then you're going to turn it clockwise. And I've turned that about an eighth of a, a whole turn. And that's all I've done to begin with. And I'm just going to now hold the guitar, recheck first and last fret. And that's taken, that actually has taken that gap right down. So that adjustment is fine for me. It's, it's gone down to just more than nothing. So a tiny bit more curved than dead flat. And I'm happy with that with that very small 1 18th, uh, sorry, 1 8th of a t whole turn adjustment. So that's how little uh, it is. And actually what, what I would suggest to you is if you, you find that over time your guitar um, flattens out and you can check it by doing the first and last fret capo if you can, or if not, then first and last fret and just check. If you don't hear any click and you can't see any gap at all, I mean the tiniest gap, no gap at all, if the string is resting dead flat on there, then you need more relief. Now to get, I've just got less relief by flattening it out. To get more relief, you turn the hex key about an eighth of a turn in the other direction. And if nothing happened, another eighth of a turn until you opened up a little tiny gap. And if it, you felt that it was more than just, uh, you know, if it had gone quite a way past being dead flat, then just dial it back a bit in the clockwise direction, tighten it up a little bit to flatten it out. And you can't do any harm. You keep going until you get what I would call a tiny bit more than flat or a tiny bit more curved than flat. So not flat, just a tiny bit of curvature. So I've got that there now with these tens on. Obviously, I'll readjust it later on when we put nines on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the uh, at the height at the bridge end. So I don't know how well you can see this. 
So I've done the relief on the neck. I'm just going to raise that up. So this is where I set the action at the bridge end. And I'm going to keep the old bridge on just for the time being. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, if I need to lower these, which I do, they're about half a millimetre too much, um, I'm going to dial them inwards clockwise, and that takes the bridge down. So I go down on this side to what I want is a one and a half. It's a tiny bit over one and a half. And this one is about 1.2. So I'm going to do another tiny bit down on there, and that's enough. So there's my height set there. Now I'm going to do my work on the nut. Now, with the nut, I'm replacing a, a solid nut with um, an adjustable one, which means you probably won't ever need to adjust it. But the reason I do use it is because, first of all, it replaces this plastic which catches the strings and stops them moving smoothly through. Um, and that gets in the way and totally messes up the tuning. So the first thing I would do is I want to replace that nut for a good quality material. And the very best quality material for stable tuning is tusk. And uh, so you could either put a solid tusk nut in here or, as is the case for all of these guitars that I do, I replace the solid nut with an adjustable one. And the adjustable is good because I can set it at exactly the right height and should you change anything gauge of strings later on we can make a tiny adjustment to it as well without having to replace the nut so there's a there's a benefit and it gives you the most important benefit which is the um, permanent lubrication of what's called PTFE and I can't remember what it's what it stands for now the good thing about these Epiphones is that they used to nuts used to come off very very easily with a light tap like that so there's a little bit of glue that's been used but not much and this plastic thing comes off which should go in the bin because it's i'd never recommend replacing it now what we do is we get from its packaging the new tusk nut now this will require a little bit of careful work to get it to exactly the right size but not too much work which is the good thing about using the uh, custom built or I could should call it laser printed bases so here's the idea there's what looks like a nut but actually it's an insert that stands on grub screws and those sit in this little base and together they make a nut and you can raise them and lower them and the, the lubrication stuff gives you the perfect smoothness for tuning stability and the um, adjustability height adjustability allows you to get the exact the perfect first fret action but also to um, ad, uh, alter it later if you need to so the first thing i'm going to do to get this right is i'm going to do a little bit of sanding with this adjustable nut uh, i've got some, some mucky old sanding block here but it's enough it's good enough for the job um, so i just have to basically first thing i'm going to do is on these I always sand down the bottom of the uh, little grub screws so that I want a flat base to spread the load. So this is a, a sort of an improvised thing of my making up, my not invention exactly but you know I, I sort of pioneered doing this on home regular guitars and one of the things I always made a point of doing is to sanding out the, the sort of cup shapes out of these feet so that they're lovely and flat. And that means that when I put them together in here into the base part, when they stand on it, they are the metal grub screw spreads the load as much as possible when it presses on this material. Right, so that is nearly ready to go in, um, but I will have to do a little bit of um, taking it back flush. So the next thing I do is a bit of very careful sanding um, and this is a bit grubby so I'll probably have to clean this off with some different sandpaper in a minute but so the aim here now is to yeah it's very filthy is to sand a perfectly smooth face between the face of the tusk front edge of the nut and the uh, the base and once I've got that beautifully smooth um, then I will be ready to put it up against the end of the neck and make sure it fits and works. 
So again, just a, a smooth, flush finish is the important bit here. So I want to make sure that I get that spot on. Even if it's grubby, we can come back and clean that out. I mean, it's invisible anyway. Okay, so that's nice and smooth. And if I turn around to look at the there, I just can now try this on the end, and that looks absolutely perfect fit to me. Um, right, butted up nicely. It's actually a fraction too wide, so I'm just going to take a little bit off the back edge of it as well. Um, it it has to fit in the little lip of paint in there, so if it doesn't, um, it won't quite sit in uh, in the space. So we need to get it down to the the width of that little gap. Uh, which requires a bit of extra working. Um, and again, that's sort of try it and see. That's nearly, that's in fact, that's pretty much dead spot on. Fits in there beautifully. Right, I'm going to stop there. So you can see that thanks to, whoops, thanks to having made. Um, having made custom made laser printer things in the past, this part works really well for um, Epiphone 339s. I know I'm pretty confident I can just drop the nut in and away it goes. So it sits beautifully into the, the little slot where the paint sits. What I can do now is I can just put the strings back in. But here's what I'm going to do before I do that. I'm going to get marker pen because in a moment I'm going to be ready for doing the fret leveling. So I'm going to mark up the frets with this marker pen before I put the strings back on and tighten them up. And this marker pen is important to the process of leveling the frets. Now in this guitar it doesn't it isn't going to require a lot of work because the frets are pretty good and they usually are on Epiphones these days. But I'm going to be leveling to try to limit or alleviate altogether that kind of repetitive buzz that I call fret slap. Um, so that's what I'm aiming for. I've got bone dust or PTFE dust. So what I'm doing is I'm laying the strings back in the, their correct places. Um, the nice thing about this too is, is you'll see that the slots on this nut go in, uh, they slant a little bit from the, the D and the G and the actually and the A and the B. So they're, they're slanted, which also helps the tuning a little bit. Um, so I tend to tighten up first and once I've tightened up, that holds the whole adjustable nut unit in place. And I can see straight away that the strings are touching the um, first fret, which is where I want them to be to begin with, because now what I'll do is I will use the hex key to just raise them a little bit off the deck and create the tiny bit of clearance that we need to make it play. And that's the beauty of this system. We just dial up the smallest amount of height at either end. And now, now you can, now that's fallen off the thing, but you can you should be able to hear them play. Right, so we're going to tighten these up as well. Now with the marker pen, I'm ready to do the fret leveling as well. Make sure they're all on the uh, saddles correctly. Okay, so the nut is perfectly in position. Everything's looking great. Going to get the... Um, Going to get the tuning fork to give myself a note to tune from to get this up to pitch. That's very low. What's happened there? Um, do I think I don't like this thing? I don't think I like this thing. This is. That's why I don't like these bridges. This is too low here but the outside one isn't so this is uneven that's why I that's the other reason I like to change them over by the way um, let's just double check
okay um that's all good what isn't good is this end here there's different heights here which aren't great and not the end of the world but we'll cure that when we oops sorry we'll cure that when we switch it over for this um now with the with the frets marked with marker pen i'm just going to stretch out a little bit more um for this pr process of fret leveling all i really want is the guitar pretty closely in tune but it doesn't have to be perfect because really i'm looking for the tension to be just about right So that is our guitar set up and ready to level. So what have I done? I first of all checked the relief and set it a tiny bit off flat. So just into the relieved, not, not flat, but just slightly relieved. How much relieved? Enough to be able to say it's relieved, but not much more. Um, definitely not concave or backbowed. So I've set the relief which is a function of the atmospheric pressure, temperature, humidity, the gauge of strings, and this particular neck and its peculiarities. So all of those things together combine to end up with some curve or no curve, and we want to set just a tiny bit. Then I've set uh, an ideal last fret action on both ends of the bridge by using the two different adjusters, and I want about 1.5 as measured here and 1.2 as measured there, and obviously a, a balance or a gradient in between as dictated by the bridge. And then at this end, we've changed out the nut. We've put a, uh, a Tusk PTFE nut on there, which is going to uh, contribute hugely towards tuning stability. Um, and we've dialed it up to just enough height to play. And that's what we want, the minimum height to play without it buzzing there and rattling off the fret. And again, it's the same as the, the relief. How much relief? Enough to just play without buzzing on the first fret. Um, and no more. There's no reason to have any greater height than that. And what you'll find now is this is suddenly will have become much lighter. You'll be able to play bar chords without any effort. So I've done the basically the physical setup of the guitar is where I want it to give a low light action. Um, the only thing we're not sure about is how all the frets now perform in this configuration. And we sort of expect them to be a bit clattery. little bit of fret buzz. Plays, but a little bit of fret slap, I should say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my fret leveling method to hopefully gently iron out the uh, cause of what I call fret slap. Now, as I said, Maybe yes, I said at the beginning. Um, fret buzz is caused by individual high frets that stand out. Fret slap, in my experience or my way of describing it, is caused by groups of frets forming hills and peaks and valleys, and all guitar necks have it. Um, this tool here, this device, and this method is great, a great method for finding out just how up and down and curvy this neck is. Now, the first indication I will have that it has these ups and downs, because all of them do will be the fact that I've got some of this what I call fret slap. That's telling me that there, there's probably likely to be three or four ups and downs, different areas in here. And this method of leveling now will pretty much reveal that. So what I do is I take this leveling tool, which is a basically a tunable leveling beam, and I put it on here, supporting the neck in the middle, and I basically tune this device by bending it until it copies the curve on this neck, but it's copying the curve as described by these three little points that I've placed on the curve, because the real curve on this neck is sort of like it's an overall curve, but it's a bit wobbly as it goes, a little bit up, a little bit down. This beam can't duplicate that up and down. I don't want it to. I want it to, I want it to, to simulate the curve um, um, an ideal version of it as as represented by these three sample points and when I do that what I find is 
that this tool then very very gently if I'm very patient and get it exactly right this tool seems to be able to drop onto the imperfect curve and just gently persuade the imperfect curve to level out a little bit and in doing so it seems to um, alleviate what I call fret slap. Now the great thing about this method is that using it now I have the a kind of ideal curve in this bar here and I put it on very lightly on this less than perfect organic curve as represented by this slightly up and downy wooden thing which as I've said before changes quite a lot throughout the year and from one day to another. So as I do a little bit of leveling with this perfect curve onto this imperfect curve the first thing that tends to show up is the points where it makes strong contact and the points where it doesn't make any contact at all and that tends to tell me where the high and low spots are so cutting cutting none 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 cutting a little bit cutting more cutting 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 and hardly any cutting none 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 cutting 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 so i can tell you right now um, it's probably good to do it. I can tell you right now, here's where the low spots are. Right? There. Um, about, about that much. There you go. So that's, now by definition, the other, those are the low spots, the other spots are high. Right? So straight away there's high, low, higher, lower, higher again so that's immediately you can see quite a complex shape and that bar has told me that by the way it's cutting certain frets and not cutting the others now whilst there is a difference between those um, it, it's a, there's a chance that you'll get what I call fret slap and what's happening is the, the plucked string is it's trying to spin but it's running into various high points. Now this is not massively scientific because if you press there, um, well it is in a way because what I've done is I've taken down now these ones that would have got in the way before. Now there's a bit more natural space. That thing's rattling. So I'm happy with that. That is both a diagnostic and a, a first pass if you like. So what I'm going to do is I'll keep the calibration of the tool the same and I'll move to the next track as I call it where the B string sits and I'm going to continue leveling using the same approach very light no down hardly any downward pressure and I am just going over the uh, frets and I'm just again watching what happens where it's cutting where it isn't and it, and it gives me again a quite good feedback so I can see there's a, a little patch of dust you might even be able to see that this is coming out as a fairly high spot in the whole neck right there is a high spot and the low spots are still there and there as we knew but that you can see that by the dust kicking up on the deck here that's clearly a high hump and we're taking it gently addressing it um, what you guess if you see those patches that aren't cut you can figure out there at the bottom of a valley And one of the things about one of the things about low spots like that is that when you're in a valley, um, a low spot will make the next average fret seem high. So high frets are a problem because they stand in the way and catch the strings. Low frets are a problem because they make the next fret relatively high. So when you have low frets, you have to play a little bit of a game of how far do I have to go to bottom out. And make them meet the surrounding frets because as i say the low fret basically sets a limitation on what you can do um, even though we sort of the mindset thinks that the high fret is the one that gets in the way in fact the low fret so if i've still got four low five low frets here if i play in there i can easily buzz out on the following frets because i'm playing into a gap or into a ditch as far as the overall shape of the neck is concerned so it's a really great method, this. You can't do this in any other way. You can't do it in the traditional fret levelling method. Happy with that. Damn, 
I can't bend tens. Um, what I usually check at this point is I want to, uh, if there are ever any chokes when we bend across, then this next um, track, the G track as I call it, is where we'll clear up any uh, issues there. So if we did have any choke outs, there's a little bit of what I call zing as I bend across, um, but this this little go over, if I calibrate it right and I, we go over this, um, this G track, that will solve those choke outs or any potential choke outs when we bend all the way across. The adjustment here is so incredibly light and delicate. Um, and there we are, we're about right. We get it just right and now we're going to level the G track by moving the string out of the way. Keeping it, it's still got tension on it, just moved. Now we're going to level the G track. Same process, gravity only really. Um, sometimes I have to put a bit more effort into it to make it work but right now it's mainly gravity because I want this curve this perfect curve or the ideal curve of this bar I really want it to impose itself onto the less than perfect uh, curve on the fretboard so again um, I can see straight away that the, the flat spot here is now narrowed down to only two frets which is good because these are now cutting you can see this is the high spot of all here right here where the dust is building up and then we've just starting to touch here so we're, we're starting to get down to level these frets here so the low spot now is only about four frets wide three frets here so we narrowed that down but you can see it's taking off quite a bit on the following ones because this one is so low the ones before are so low so that's the compromise if you if you have low frets you have to bottom them out and that means taking metal from the surrounding frets that's brilliant don't mind the tuning right now but that plays fine so now we're going to get into the area where the strings move more I don't know if that's a bit of screw rattle but a little bit up here a little bit up here again as we go into the low spot this is hitting on the frets afterwards low spot there hitting on that one um, it's the A and the E that's going to clear up most but we'll calibrate for the D first and we'll get stuck into that and so this process then covers all strings, all tracks. And once we've done that, we've basically done all the precision work. The remainder is clear up, um, polish out, recrown the frets, because in leveling them, we, we turn them from a nice arch shape into a bit of a flat, a slight flat top. But we need to recrown them to reshape them without taking them any lower or changing the height at all and then once we've re-crowned them uh, we need to sand and polish them back out into a nice playing condition um, and then after that it's uh, clean the guitar check everything fix the little things like the loose switch down here um, and then oil the fingerboard put new strings on and the most important thing at the end is to stretch the strings out and this is something that people forget or don't know about. It's like a miraculous thing. And this is a secret that I want Lee to know so that you can enjoy having a guitar that stays in tune forever. 50% of your tuning stability fifty percent of your tuning stability is in the nut, right? If you've got plastic, it'll make your guitar go out of tune all the time. If you've got bone, it'll probably make the guitar go out of tune because the the nut slots very often cap, still catch the strings with bone. It's quite hard you, to, to make them run smoothly. So the best one, 50% of tuning stability is in your nut, which is why I fit a tusk nut and it's why I make sure that the, uh, the, the first fret action is perfect without having to cut into the slots at all. So you've got half of the deal of your tuning stability is now done with this new nut. So you won't have to change that, you're halfway there. The next stage 
the next part has to do with you and that is the other 50% of tuning stability when you play this guitar onwards into the future is how much unreleased slack there is in your new strings so we put new strings on and most people give them a bit of a stretch and then they play and then this guitar will continually slowly go out of tune with the help of a crap nut um, now we've got a good nut now we're going to do in a minute we're going to stretch out the new strings and if you take the time to stretch them out the way I'll show you that plus the nut will give you fantastic tuning stability um, and once you have that tuning stability this will be, you know you'll go for this guitar every time if you have more than one you'll always be reaching for this one because it stays in tune and that's an incredibly important quality uh, once you've had a guitar that you know stays in tune and perhaps even better that you know why it stays in tune or is so easy to get in tune and then keep in tune um, then you'll never satisfy you'll never settle for another one that doesn't little bit there still and that's a low spot that's why a little bit more still particularly down there that one um, yeah so that that's the thing genuinely once you've got a guitar that stays in tune you won't want to play any other one that doesn't because it's just such a frustrating experience um, it's only then we sort of realize how much an in-tune guitar or a guitar that stays and plays in tune um, makes up you know our enjoyment of playing now because these um, frets here are a little bit more uneven I'm having to do a little bit of extra work on those um, but it's the only way we're going to get a nice low action and um, get rid of that fret slap <laughs> okay with that that's pretty good um, final calibration for the low E again this is always the harder one because it moves so much when you when you hit the uh, pluck the string so it's always going to be moving more and therefore it it's less tolerant of uneven frets so this is why we're going to pay special attention to get it uh, evened out and that basically as i've said means just ironing out some of these hills and valleys that it has naturally so again very little downward pressure just letting the uh, sandpaper 400 grit is doing the business and then we just want to basically impose that curve onto this whole thing and expect to need to do it at all parts of the neck so I'll go right up here and ensure that we've kind of put some, a little bit of pressure on there Again, the high spots that we've seen before are showing up still as high on, on this end. So it's all, there's nothing untoward about it or nothing surprising. We knew from the beginning that was a high spot right there and it's showing up even still. So it's rather than, it tells us that rather than being a, a fret that's maybe not seated properly, it's definitely a, a kind of uh, hump at this point. Very close. What height are we doing here? So we're, we're just on, we're barely 1.5, but I'll do a tiny bit more. Um, sometimes I, or typically I usually set that too low and I aim a bit too ambitiously. But in a way, it's never any harm to do that because you're not going to, you know, you start off with even more accurate frets to begin, begin with, which is not a bad thing. So I'm just going to concentrate on this end part here a little bit and then back down to the low spot here a little bit and then in between and then we'll think that we'll call that it 
So the end result of all of this will be something that feels lighter to play. Yes, so we're almost there. So I can just test, test for my own benefit. Now what you'll hear, because I'm tuning now with this tusk nut, you'll hear this tune up very easily. No pings. There you go. No rattle, no fret rattle, nothing. Beautiful. So there we have it. The precision part of the levelling work done. And what we tend to now do is we tend to do a couple of things. It's time to first of all remove these strings. They've done their service. And a bit of advice is when you're removing strings on a guitar like this with a uh, adjustable nut is do the outside inwards first so that you keep the last two on right till the end and that will stop the the uh, insert risking jumping out because sometimes it will so last two this one first and that one's still held down and then we're done with that one okay so we're gonna take off We've been attacked by crows. It's Hitchcock's The Birds. Um, so I'm going to take all these off, clean everything up. Um, clean everything up. Um, and recrown the frets, followed by polishing that. The, the recrowning, I'll show you what I do. The polishing out part takes about 20 minutes of noisy, mindless labour, which I'll do off camera. Um, I'll also show you when you come to re-fit the strings, how I do it, and you don't need to do any of this twisting around, locking extra loops around that somebody's done on here. It's a little bit difficult, and I end up, it usually ends up getting someone like me getting their hands caught and stabbed. Um, but you don't need to do that. It's a very simple way of um, restringing. But this this is a this is annoying this loopy fold back business because it ends up catching me out. Luthiers or techs don't like it. Right, so these strings will go in the bin. Get rid of them straight away. We will remove the original bridge. Put it out of the way. <laughs> And we'll place on the new one, ready to go, because that will be... Actually, we can just leave it off for now. But that will be ready to go on. Now, here's what we do. The fingerboard could do with a good clean, which is great. I'll do that off camera as well. So the first thing I'm doing now is I'm going to repaint all of the frets again in marker pen. And this is now so that I can re-crown them. And that is to take them from a uh, an arch-shaped thing which has got a flat spot on the top in various different places of differing degrees um, and to reshape that sh uh, that flattened arch into a complete smooth arch um, that, that doesn't have a flat spot on top. Um, let's see if you can see. So this is what I do. Let's maybe zoom up. We'll just look at these first couple. So what I do is I use this um, thingy file. What's it called? Um, it's called a concave um, diamond coated uh, crowning file. And I'm going to use the medium size, medium jumbo size. And what I do is I run it over the top and what you get straight away is it shows up. It starts at the edge, the curved edge of this concave shape. Um, rounds off any flat spots and where the fret has had more flattening you have to do a little bit more work and the aim is to um, 
round off the frets and end up leaving a tiny thin line of the marker pen running down the center of the fret. Now if you can do that, it tells you that you've reshaped the fret I, I adequately without touching the top. And if you haven't touched the top, then it means you can't have changed the overall height of the fret because obviously we've done the leveling before. So we're, we're basically reshaping the fret within the material we've got left. And this marker pen business is a very neat little guide telling, telling us how to do that. And so I go down all of these to reshape. Some the the, the taller ones will uh, take longer to do because I'll have to have flattened more material than uh, other places. So you can sort of you can tell by how long I end up spending on a particular part of the neck where the um, the most work had to be done in, in leveling. So you can you you already know you expect to see me slow down when I get to around this middle of the uh, yeah middle of the neck around the twelfth fret. You, we already know that that's cut much more material than anywhere else because it's a general hump. Um, so when I get to there, I will be doing a bit more work, and it's starting now on the particularly on the base side. I'm having to concentrate on reshaping and just keeping that little thin line of uh, thin line of pen down the top. So this is a, a very time-honoured, time-served method. Uh, are we still recording? I haven't run out of stuff yet. That's good. My phone's let me down a few times recently. Uh, so, so when we come to the, uh, the, the restringing, um, I'll, you know that that's when we'll see what it takes to stretch the slack out of the strings. And there's a lot of misunderstanding, misconceptions about that. Um, a lot of people think a few really big tugs will do it, and some people think you know a few goes and then leave it overnight and it will settle itself. And to my surprise, I discovered that the slack in your strings will not eke itself out. Uh, it, it'll stay there and it will come out over time pretty much every time you bend a note um, and and particularly it's doubly problematic if your nut slots are gripping because then you'll have some slack which um, will get caught and the pressure will be different on one side of the nut to the other and that's uh, and that's what stores the problems up and then when you bend the note or press hard or push the string sideways it pushes overcomes the resistance in the slot and that then um, pulls that uh, little bit of string through equalizes the tension and in doing so it makes it out of tune um, and it just will keep on doing that it's got so many little tiny bits of that in a, in a, a typical set of strings it can do that for years on end um, so you really have to do it deliberately and manually if you want to stay in tune. And I just think if you get into the habit of doing it for 20 minutes or however long it takes to stop detuning when you deliberately try to detune it, then you can be confident that you don't have to worry about it for the next few months while you're playing the guitar. And to me, that's well worth the 20 minutes at the beginning. Right, so that's the recrowning part done. So now I'm going to go off camera. I'm going to clean everything up. I will also li lightly glue this down, but it's so nicely fitting it will hardly need any anything just to hold it from side to side. That's beautifully fitting. Clean everything up, give it all a polish, tighten up the thing there, um, and come back when I'm about to restring. So I will have cleaned up the fingerboard, um, polished out these frets with a whole series of paper grades, different grades of paper and micro mesh sheets. Good old clean up and then restring and stretch out. See you in a minute. Ta -da! All cleaned. Cleaned up, went down, polished out, uh, three way toggle switch tightened, checked. So everything's good to go. And um, basically, 
ready to put strings on and do the old stretching out. Bit of clean rag. It's very hard to clean black finish guitars because they show up every bit of dust and they look terrible. Right, so uh, when I'm here in this view, I'm going to get some oil and I'm going to uh, get the oil onto the fingerboard. Um, doesn't require too much, just a, a little bit to darken it down and then we'll wipe off any excess and then we'll go for the, the new bridge on, new strings on, bridge uh, nut back on and so on and we'll be heading for the stretch out and finale. And uh, hopefully then Alan can come and get this tomorrow being Monday. And there we go. A nice little bit of oil just to darken everything down. And uh, again, we don't want loads of oil sitting on the surface, so I like to just wipe off the excess like that. Okay. So we put on the new bridge. Uh, when we put things back on like this, we have to keep in mind that the, everything will have moved a little bit so it's very likely the action will have changed slightly and we need to be prepared for that. <laughs> um, now remember I've got to recheck the truss rod when we've got these nines on because we can expect that to be a different fit um, or sorry a different amount of tension so we could expect it to, to pull a different kind of relief into the neck. So what I was just going to um, show you now if I can keep this in one place. We're we running? Yeah we must be. Yeah it's counting. Um, this is how I put the strings on. So with the adjustable nut I recommend that you do the middle two first. So we start with the D and the G just to hold that nut in place. And I've noticed I'm keeping the um, keeping the truss rod cover off for a minute. So we need the stop bar and then the D, and the G, D, and the G. As soon as you put something, new stuff on, it's, the dust just gets on onto the, uh, the finish. And it's too depressing because you just cleaned it and made a sterling effort. So what I also want to do is, before I do this, is get everything lined up so that we can get the strings through easily enough without messing about. So the D on first. Now here's how I do it. It's kind of important so you don't need to tie any tangled bits and double back knots or anything. So pull the string right the way through and then come up to the first fret, pull back one fret and hold it and then start winding whilst holding it. Okay so that's what I call the held string and that's the loose string. So I hold it and send the loose string under the held string the first time. Keep the pressure on and as it comes round, yank up the loose string and direct the held string underneath the loose string as it comes round. And that one fret's worth is just enough to put enough locking turns on there, two turns on basically, and there you've got it nicely locked on without any excess um, material. So you're minimising the amount of uh, string you're putting on the peg for starters, which is always a good thing to do. So with the, the G, Again, all the way through, pull back one. This time you have to hold it with the thumb and you're changing hands. So you're holding it and just letting it slack off just so that the, the loose one goes under the held one. And as it comes around, pull up the loose one, grab the held one and sort of tension it so you can steer it underneath the loose one as the loose one comes around and then keep it there until you're in tightened up and then just check it's on the roller and that's all good and then snip back the excess so there's the the, uh, the D and the G holding the nut in place and I, you know I can look at it at that point and make sure that the nuts seated properly there's nothing missing it's all in the base is uh, glued on so that's held in place and the top bit is pretty well fixed in there and it probably won't fall out but I always like to double check make sure if it comes out and I put it back in make sure it fits in nice and snugly okay so now we're going to do the B goes through 
pulls taut, puts it on the saddle, pulls it back one, holds it with thumb, wind on, send the loose one underneath. And if it doesn't go of its own accord, just lift the lift and hold the held one, loose one underneath, and then pull up the loose one and push the held one below the loose one for the second time round. And take your finger out before you slice it off. There we go. Check it's on the sad uh, saddle. Oh, this string. Holy crap, this is a dud string. <sighs> this never happens, that's not fair. It has happened and it's cost me one string. Let me replace this string. Damn it. Set of strings. Let me get a decent set of strings. I don't like that. And now, rooting around in the string departments. Uh, what size gauge are these? Anyone going to tell me? Nine gauge. Okay, thank you. Oh, wait a minute, these are singles. These are nine gauge singles. Go. Oh. Nice idea, but not quite what we want. Uh, so what's these? Eights and tens. Mm, watch out for those. We had some of those before, didn't want those. Uh, anybody, anybody find me? But loads of nines, extra nines. I don't want that. I want a set of strings, man. Nine, eleven, forty-two. Here we go. Right, I just want one string from here, please. <sighs> what was it we needed? That was a B, wasn't it? Dang. That's a, a shame, but that's not good enough. That's I, I should really be able to get a refund, but it's too much. Like hard work. But that's a defect. A proper good old fashioned defect. So let's get it out and gone. Might be worth taking it. I don't mind. I'm going to put it back in the bag and take it home and complain about it because that's just it's money, you know. I keep spending enough on these things and it's just garbage. Right, in you go. Don't like you. I want my money back. Come on, give me a replacement. Right, what do we do? B, second string. Damn it. Dang, damn it. Right. Right, let's do that again. To Dario, get out of the way. Right, pull back one fret's worth. Start winding over the top of the loose one. Pull up the loose one. Direct it down and under the loose one. Thank you. Up and onto the roller safely. I'm done. Right. High E. No problem with that one. <sighs> okay, so the next bit will be the magic of string stretching. And uh, this is where you can occasionally break a string as well. Um, but you have to be careful. Nines and below. Nines and lighter do run the risk of string breaks when stretching, but if you're careful, you should avoid it. Right, two bass strings, here we come. A and the E. Twine. So don't forget, we'll check the um, the neck relief once these are up to pitch and the correct loading is on the neck. 
Um, I think we'll probably find that it's just about right. But we may have to make a tiny adjustment, which will be fine. Okay, and finally, the E, the low E. Usually these bridges come fairly well intonated, so I don't usually expect to have to make too much adjustment, but we will see. Okay, strings loaded and snipped. Time to just make sure everything's on. What I'll do first, see now. Um, yeah, what I'll do first here is I'll just check the bridge height settings to see how close we are to the original bridge and whether we need to adjust. So 1.5 just more than, 1.2 a little more than, that's actually quite nice. So let's just go for a, a very quick tune up, if I can find the tuning fork, just to get to roughly to tension. Right, so tune it up again. Now looking a little bit high over the first fret, um, having taken the top off and put it back in, so I'm just going to reduce this down a little bit both ends. We'll see how that sits. Get it to tune and then we'll stretch. Nice. Um, right, let's quickly look at the relief. So lighter gauge strings, hardly any relief at all now. But I'll take a tiny bit off there, but it's very close to where we want it. So uh, need a tiny bit more curvature. I'm going to just slack off about a tenth of a turn, not much more than that. Um, so we get, excuse me, we get um, just a little bit more gap and it's only enough to hear the press down. Okay, so here's the important bit. So remember 50% of our tuning stability is the nut, we've got that taken care of. 50% is the slackened strings. And so to get that out, we start and we grab each string and we push and pull between thumb and four fingers up and down the string. And what you're going to find is this is going to put it out of tune. So we jump to the next string. Uh, it will put them all out of tune. And that's what we expect. And this is us forcing the slack out of the string. So we need to do this for all of them, keeping in mind that the thinner they go, the more fragile they are. So we want to be kind of, we need to use a little bit of force on them to release the, um, whatchamacallit, slack, um, but we don't want to overstress them. Otherwise we'll be looking for a new string or a new set again. Um, so, and also the this most of the slack is held in the lower strings. So there we go, there's our first stretch. So.
See how much out down that was? So all of that big detuning, of, to me it's visually like that much, all of that would be le leaching out millimeter by millimeter th throughout the weeks and months if you didn't do this bit now. So it might as well do it now, get it all out of the way, and then it just won't do it to you when you don't expect it. So we're nearly there. So I hope... That was a useful um, demonstration of what we're doing for power. Are we still running? We are, blimey. Doesn't normally last the whole session. Um, yeah, I hope that was helpful to see the different stages and for me to explain them. Getting there. So much easier to play. Right, I'm going to give it one more stretch like this, and then a couple more bends and things, and then we're done. And this is ready to send home. A bit of a dust off at home once I've got it away from the dust of the workshop, and then we're good to go. Um, Yeah, so that's a pretty standard setup that I do um, and do a lot of on these um, Epiphones, the 339s. A lovely shape, size of guitar um, and can be improved by this work, as you've seen. And, um, you know, it's been had a great success with 339s along the way, um, which I think is why I keep getting more and more 339 business um, they they are very good guitars full stop but they are even better when they've had this work done and the real the real value is getting the um, getting the frets right and getting the tuning stable and once you've got that it's a it's a guitar that you know there's no reason to give it up or change for another one it sort of whoops becomes a you know, one you want to turn to every time. Okay, so I'm just going to give this a little bit of a pull here now. And then we'll be done, I think. Do a bit of play at test play at home, but very careful when bending and pulling that E. Okay, final piece of work now to do on this guitar is to set the intonation. Now the intonation is a, a physical thing. Every guitar, every string requires its own separate playing length. So basically you have uh, what's called a scale length, which is um, a nominal length, playing length of string. So. Um, there are a few different scale lengths used for different types of guitars and over the years they've come down into some standards and the reason why you could make a different one you could make a, an individual one each time and change it on every guitar you built and build a, build a new guitar the next guitar you could build to another scale length and so on but the reason they use um, standards is so that people can make interchangeable parts and um, everything works uh, with everything else. So 
you, there are standards. This is made to a, a 500 and uh, is it six? No, no, it's not five. 600 and, uh, 628 millimeter scale, which means the distance from the front edge of the uh, nut down here to the apex of the high E string usually is 628 um, millimeters. And but every string needs to be slightly different, so they're not all exactly 628. So the E might be 628 or 629. Um, the B needs to be a little bit longer because it's thicker. The G needs to be a little bit longer because it's thicker again. The D uh, needs to come back a bit shorter than the G because it's it's thicker, but it's made of wound construction. And then the A is wound and thicker again, so it steps back a bit longer until the final, the longest one in the whole series is the low E, which probably comes in at about six. If it's a 628 millimeter scale, it's probably about 632. It might be as much as four millimeters difference. So each string is a little different length. And the way we check that the saddles are in the right position on your bridge is not by measuring it, um, it's by using sound. And what we do is we, we ping the harmonic at the 12th fret. So we tune, let's say it's out of tune, we ping the harmonic at the 12th fret. We tune that up using our tuner to the E note, high E note. Okay, and then we fret that same note at the 12th fret. And they should be exactly the same. As you can see here, it is. And that's pretty good because these guys set the saddles in the right place pretty much all the time. So every time I put one of these on, they're almost spot on. Then we check the B the same way. Yep. G. These flat for now. Now, those of you who are watching this thinking, hang on a minute, there's a variable in here that could mess this whole thing up. He's saying we ping the harmonic, tune it to E, and then fret it. One thing that we all do differently is that we fret notes differently. So if I fret that note harder, twice as hard as you, just because of my style, um, I can make it go sharp when it's dead on true for you. And so to get it to, uh, intonated for me with my grip, my fretting grip, might require a different length, slightly different length, string length for that string than you do. So the thing to keep in mind is that um, Intonation is subjective for every single player. Um, I've done it as best I can. Right, so just quick play, by the way, your adjuster key for the, the, the nut here is in the bag with the original bridge. I'm just going to tweak the bridge. I'll probably tweak it again tomorrow before Alan comes to get it. But yeah, so, um, so there is no absolute it's down to how you, not only is the amount of relief, for example, needed down to how hard you hit the strings, the length of your each string where you set your intonation depends on how hard you fret a note and how lightly I fret a note. So I'll have a different length a string, slightly different length to you. So that's how subjective it is. So um, I'll, I'm setting it sort of as average as I can get it, but you may find that if you grip twice as hard as me or half as hard as me, you may find that it's, it could be slightly off for you. And I can't predict that. I can only do an average as close as I can get it. But that's intonation for you. And it means that when I've got about the... When that note equals that note, it means I've got the right length of string overall. And it means, therefore, that the divisions on the neck, the frets, will all play notes that are true and in tune with each other. If I knock a centimetre off this length here, then none of these notes will be in tune with the rest of the guitar. Um, so that's why you have to get the intonation right. There it is. I hope that Lee's going to notice that's a lot easier to play, lighter to play, and you'll notice that it stays in tune a million times better now as well. So there you go, ES dot ES. Um, 339 um, setup 
new nut, new bridge, frets leveled, um, fret slap removed and reduced, cleaned up, um, toggle tightened up and ready to go. Um, the only difference, oh, the only one thing I might say here is got a quite a in difference here between the um, pickups. The neck pickup is very low and the bridge pickup is very high. Um, I would sort of balance them out a bit here to start with. Um, the only, there's no, again, like people say, what should I have my pickup set at? There is no hard and fast rule, right? You have to remember a principle, and the principle says um, the closer the pickups are to the strings, the greater the output to your amp. And so it will sound louder and maybe a bit more broken up. Um, but the less nuanced the tonal dynamic is, the further away the pickup is from the strings, the lower the output, the less it will drive your, your amp, but you can turn the volume up on your amp, um, but the greater the tonal harmonic or tonal um, spectrum is for the notes. So I tend to, if you look at all the great players of old, they tend to have more rather than less space between strings and pickups in my experience. You take someone like Gary Moore, look at his Les Paul, people like that, um, Jimmy Page, you know, their, their pickups tend to be almost flush with the rings. So they tend to keep them further away wherever possible. Not, not universally, there are exceptions to all those things, but it seems to be quite common that's the case. So, but the general rule is closer you are, the more um, greater the output from your guitar to the amp, but the perhaps the less clear the tonal dynamic is. Okay, there we go, all done. Sunday night, I'm going home. Thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, letting me set up your guitar, Lee, and I hope you enjoy it for many years to come. See you soon. Mm -hmm.